up first, it's my honor to introduce our first keynote speaker, the Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, Ms. Heidi Hsu. In this role, Ms. Hsu serves as the, as the Chief Technology Officer for the entire Department of Defense. She's mandated with ensuring the technological superiority of the United States military, and she's responsible for research, development, and prototyping, pro prototyping activities across the entire DOD enterprise. That enterprise includes DARPA, the Missile Defense, the Missile Defense Agency, the Defense Innovation Unit, the DOD Laboratory and Engineering Center Enterprise, and a deeply technical undersecretariat staff, all focused on developing advanced technology and capabilities uh, for the United States military. Previously, she served as the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition Logistics and Technology, and as the Vice President of Technology Strategy for the Raytheon Company Space and Airborne Systems. She holds a Bachelor of Degree in Mathematics from the University of New Brunswick in Canada, and Master of Science degrees from the University of Toronto and UCLA. And she's received an honorary doctorate of science from the University of New Brunswick. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Heidi Hsu to the stage. Good afternoon. I'd like to uh, begin this session by paying a tribute to Dr. Ash Carter. Those of you guys seeing this room who've had the pleasure of working with, with uh, Dr. Ash Carter, he was a giant in our field, right? Uh, Ash was, uh, when I first met him, he was the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics, and I was the Army Acquisition Executive and met very frequently with him and worked very closely with him. And then he left, the then the administration got him back as a deputy secretary of defense, then he rose to become the secretary of defense. I can tell you, he cared passionately uh, about the people in the US and about where we're heading in the future. The reason I am back here, um, is because of Ash Carter. Ash Carter actually called me up and said, Heidi, this is a pivotal time in this nation. We need to have steerage in science and technology and research and development that's gonna set this nation forward for the next 30 years. The nation needs you. So that's the reason I'm back. So it was, Greatly uh, heartened uh, to, uh, to hear that he passed away last night, uh, but uh, this, I just want to uh, indicate to all of you guys what a tremendous impact that he has made in my life and probably a lot of, uh, a lot of you guys in this audience as well. So, good afternoon. It's great to be here. I'm very excited to be here with you in uh, beautiful Atlanta. It's fantastic, nice and sunny, perfect weather on the outside, okay? I want to take a moment to uh, thank our wonderful host here at Georgia Tech. I'd like to note that Georgia Tech Research Institute is one of the department's 14 university-affiliated research center, UARCs, that's what we call them. Sponsored by the Army, GTRI's research is focused on important areas in national security, um, like cybersecurity, radar, electronic warfare, autonomous system, et cetera. I very much enjoyed uh, visiting GTRI's facility earlier today. I will also like to say a big thank you to Stephanie Tompkins, the director of DARPA, for bringing DARPA forward to different regions across the US, which is so important. Let but today, I would like to focus my remarks on the challenges that the DOD is facing. The national defense strategy is focused on three key aspects. First, integrated deterrence, making full use of all warfighting domains, air, space, land, surface, underwater, as well as cyber, and leveraging our partners and allies to strengthen our strategic environment and networking together to ensure interoperability. Second, campaigning, 
creating new dilemmas for our adversaries, linking our actions together and coordinating and collaborating across our forces. Third, building en enduring advantage, eliminating barriers for small business to work with the DOD, enable that we have a healthy industrial base, and in developing new operating concepts and new testing valuation techniques and new capabilities, as well as build a strong STEM workforce. So if you think about a highly contested environment that we will be fighting in against a pure adversary, our systems must still operate when GPS is denied to us. We must still be able to operate when our radar systems are being jammed and our systems and infrastructure are under cyber attack. That is why I am interested in assured PNT, position navigation timing. Quantum sensors hold the promise of delivering unprecedented accuracy in position navigation and timing. Quantum computers can provide unprecedented computational speeds and potentially help to solve the department's hardest analytical problems. We need the ability to detect, to identify, and track a very diverse set of targets, spanning from mobile to fixed sites to camouflage systems. We need our capabilities to be operable in all weather environments. Targets spanning from small to large, from su subsonic speed to hypersonic speeds. The environments we have to fight in span from mountainous to urban to subsurface to triple canopy. Just a few examples. We must have the ability to produce an integrated picture of the environment that we're going to be fighting in. This integrated picture must be easy to comprehend to enable rapid decision making. We need to be able to provide a common operating picture to geographically dispersed operations. This is why we're interested in ease of use human machine interfaces. In addition, rapid advancements in AR and VR will help us to provide highly immersive, realistic training environments with real-time feedback to improve warfighter performance. We're interested in integrated sensing and cyber, the ability to seamlessly operate in the intersection of signal intelligence, radar, electronic warfare, and cyber defense to provide the agility that our service members need. In a highly contested fight, hundreds of missiles and UASs may be attacking us simultaneously from land, from ship, from underwater to air. We must be able to detect, identify, acquire, track, and cue a diverse set of weapon systems and send information seamlessly across different platforms that were never designed to operate together. This requires an integrated network system of systems capability. In the near future, you can imagine a swarm of drones programmed autonomously to attack us. This is why we need trusted AI and autonomy techni technologies to be designed into our system from the beginning. AI holds the promise of greatly reducing our workload. In the defense of our four bases, our homeland defense, we need a layered defense strategy that does not rely upon a single technology or a single weapon system. Threats span from cyber attack to UASs, to cruise missiles launched from submarines or from the air to hypersonic weapons that can come from
from any direction. This is why we're interested in hypersonics and directed energy. In addition, we have to be cognizant of chemical and biological threats. We must be able to quickly identify the threat, alert all the personnel, and quickly counter the effects. Under biotechnology, we're looking at ways of preventing the next pandemic. Last month, the president signed an executive order on advancing biotech and biomanufacturing innovation. The goal is to accelerate biotech innovation and grow America's bioeconomy across multiple sectors, including health, agriculture, and energy. The other challenges that everyone has seen during this pandemic is supply chain disruption. In the area of microelectronics, our dependence on offshore suppliers created significant risks to our commercial and defense market. 70% of the microelectronics are produced in Asia. This is why Congress recently appropriated $52 billion in the CHIPS Act to reshore our foundries. The DOD will receive $2 billion to stand up our microelectronics commons effort. This is a regional lab to fab capability to enable researchers access to a prototype lab to accelerate the capability demonstration of the latest technologies. Advanced materials are needed to greatly reduce our logistics burden in transport, transporting fuel, food, water, um, weapon systems over wide distances. We need materials that are lighter but stronger, materials that can handle very high temperature, new energetics materials, higher efficiency solar cells, atmospheric water extraction, materials that can be radiation hardened from design, etc. In the area of space, we must have the ability to rapidly regenerate capabilities if our space assets are under attack. Okay. This is exactly why we're heading towards a proliferated hybrid architecture. Our space technology must incorporate technologies that enhance the DOD's adaptive and reconfigurable capabilities in space situation awareness, space control, communication path diversity, on-orbit processing, and autonomy. To reduce our logistic burden in a contested fight, ideally we can, re we can generate renewable energy at the point of need. Renewable energy generation and storage will decrease a warfighter's vulnerability. In the area of future G, namely beyond 5G, we need to be developing critical technologies and establishing the next generation of standards. The central challenge for the DOD is to accelerate the development and deployment of 5G-enabled capabilities while ensuring that those systems, as well as those of our allies and partners, are robust, are protected, and reliable. As you can see, our challenges are great. Our strategic adversaries have made it clear that they're more than willing to violate geopolitical norms to get their way. We have already seen this in Ukraine. Our adversaries are aggressively pursuing modernization of their military and development of novel capabilities. We must work together to preserve our nation's technological edge. I hope these events are a venue for you to hear about the opportunities that we have for engagement with the DOD and also for you to learn more about what our priorities are. Thank you once again to DARPA and Georgia Tech for hosting us today and thank you for being here. Your contributions through your research will ensure our national and economic security. I'll be happy to take a few questions from the audience time permitting.
Good afternoon. I'm Tabitha Thompson with DARPA Public Affairs. As a reminder, we are accepting questions via the virtual event platform. You can scan the QR code on the screen. That should pop up. <laughs> so um, if you scan the code, you'll be able to answer your question directly. Um, but Ms. Shu, we'll start with um, one first question. You mentioned in your remarks that you had toured the facilities at GTRI earlier today. Is there any from, anything from that tour you'd like to highlight or any technology that caught your eye, research you'd like to highlight? Yes, certainly in the area I've talked about integrated sensing and cyber. When I talked about integrated sensing, I talked about being able to operate in the intersection of capability that used to have standalone systems, right? Uh, we absolutely need the agility now to be able to operate in the intersection. And uh, I was very happy to see GTRI is already there. <laughs> okay. Excellent. All right. Uh, our second question is, what do you see as the biggest disconnect in trying to recruit non-traditional talent to national security research and development efforts? I think a lot of the folks don't really know the kind of really tough and interesting technical problems that we have. I think once you find that out, it becomes really appealing to jump in because a problem that you end up solving it has an impact on national security, right? You're not just uh, helping uh, somebody to buy food faster, right? Or uh, an app to do something that's probably less significant, but literally impacting national security uh, for our future. And what you could be working on could be saving lives for our soldiers, for our airmen, for our guardians, for our Marines. There's a huge impact on what you do. I think that is the key message that we need to, sh to let people know about, okay? I think once they bite that apple, understand they can make a huge impact, it is hard to go back to do something a little bit less exciting, <laughs> okay? Um, not too far off from that, um, the next question is, how can we do a better job of leveraging commercial efforts into DOD programs? Yeah, I tell you, uh, Commercial technology had progressed so fast, and we literally are looking at what we can do to tap into commercial capabilities. I can tell you that uh, this is one of the key reasons that Dr. Ash Carter created the Defense Innovation Unit, DIU, in Silicon Valley, literally to tap into the, the uh, commercial capability that we have. So DIU, in addition to AFWorks, SoftWorks, Naval X, Army Rapid Capability Critical Technology Office are now all looking externally into the commercial uh, area to see if there are commercial company that can help solve their problem. Solution may exist uh, that's uh, dual use, that won't take a decade to, to develop, so this is why we're interested in looking at the commercial capability that may be out there. And uh, we definitely are looking, figuring out how we can pull these capabilities through a lot quicker, okay? Uh, I, I would just expand on one thing. The funding we received this year, called APFIT, Accelerate uh, Procurement and Fielding of Innovative Technology. That's what the acronym stands for, right? $100 million, even though $100 million relative to the defense budget is a drop in the bucket. But what that helped us do was help 10 different small companies to accelerate production. They had demonstrated a prototype that was ready to go into production, but in the typical DOD budget cycle, you have to wait two years after you demonstrate your capability for somebody to program it into the budget because we're working two years ahead of time, okay? So if I see something today I really want, I'm already working on budget two years from now to get it into the program. So what that, with the current year money, we're able to close the gap for these 10 companies to accelerate capabilities delivery to warfighters two years sooner. And $10 million for a small company, it's big bucks, right? 
Um, again, not terribly far off from that. Um, how do you communicate the critical parts of classi classified problems to the unclassified research community? Yeah, so we do that, right? We do that today. I mean, special ops guys do a great job of taking a classified problem and decompose it into unclassified pieces in which you can then solve, right? So not everybody in this room has to be clear into his highest classification level as long as you under what, uh, understand uh, what capability end state that you want, you can decompose it into a way that's unclassified. Once you do that, you have a much great, bigger audience of folks that can tackle the problem. And this is what we're trying to do. Okay. Okay. Um, the next audience question is, what programs do you have to accelerate successful technological developments into practical use for DOD and commercial applications? Well, I, I can, well, there's, uh, I may be here for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> what we're trying to do, I, I'll tell you several activities that's ongoing within uh, the Department of Defense. I engage with CEOs of small companies on a monthly basis, and literally they tell me about the pain points that they have in working with the DOD. I engage with medium-sized uh, company CEOs as well as the CTOs of the top seven uh, primes, okay? And I hear very diverse issues and challenges that they have. So what I did, you know, being the engineer, I compile a spreadsheet, right? <laughs> okay, from my spreadsheet, I literally uh, mapped it into different area, er, pain points relative to budgeting, pain points relative to contracting, pain points relative to getting security clearances, et cetera. So I shared that with the Deputy Secretary of Defense, and she said, this is fantastic. Let's expand this to make sure it, it isn't just you working on it, but other undersecretary also focusing on it. So I can tell you uh, on the security aspect, um, small company complaint, why does it take a year for me to get a secret clearance? <laughs> why is it so hard to get my facility cleared? Uh, so literally, uh, Undersecretary of Intelligence Security is tackling that problem. He got tasked with it, okay? Undersecretary of Acquisition Sustainment got uh, tagged into solving workforce innovation, okay? In terms of how do we grow the workforce? What problem do we have within the DOD? and also the larger community. And I got tagged in terms of building a bridge across a valley of death. You guys know what that means, right? Namely, you build a prototype, it's really great, demonstrate utility, and how do you take it to production? How do you get somebody on the other side of the bridge to say, hey, I love this technology, I want a thousand of them, <laughs> as opposed to the one or two that you built, okay? So this is what I'm focusing on. We're coming up with all kinds of initiatives. And it'll be uh, launched soon, okay? One other thing I think I will uh, share with you is one of the things that we are planning to do, uh, I'm getting ahead of my headlights, so, so you're getting the preview, okay? We're, we're planning uh, to initiate a, a uh, conference in which I will get all the services that's working on a common problem, okay, to basically come and brief to the public, to universities, to uh, uh, defense company as well as non-traditional companies about um, what their plans are within the laboratory, what they're funding in terms of s &T. Then we're planning to have program managers to talk about their needs. So this way, we can share technology across the board, across the services. So that should be coming where we're starting to plan for uh, initiating something like that uh, early part of next year, okay? Great. Um, next question, uh, what, do you ha what goals do you have for the FY24 budget request regarding rapid defense experimentation reserve and potential fielding opportunities? Yeah. So, uh, it, FY24, there's two sprints, okay? Uh, RADAR, for those of you guys know, stands for Rapid Defense Experimentation Reserve. Uh, in second half of 23, we're starting the first sprint in terms of doing this type of uh, experimentation. 
In 24, there's two different sprints. Each sprint cycles six months apart. And the purpose of Raider really is to solve joint warfighting challenges. The joint staff has come up with joint warfighting challenges and working, looking for solutions to solve those problem sets. So 24-2, literally, I was reviewing the charts this week before I came here, okay? And it's gonna go up to what's called a DMAG, Defense Management Action Group. DMAG is a four-star forum in which budget decisions are being made. So literally, that is going to be presented uh, to, to have a certain request with the, of the budget. Uh, so it's, uh, it's this week, the DMAG. So, so it's coming. Well-timed question. Uh -huh. um, what should professors at technical universities do to better serve the needs of DARPA and the Department of Defense? I would say, first of all, uh, you should, uh, if you could, do a stint at DARPA. DARPA does the coolest thing within DOD. I mean, literally. There's the cool kids, okay? <laughs> they're, they're the big brains, right? They're the ones that's solving out of the, uh, thinking out of the box, solving the toughest challenges. What Stephanie says is absolutely true. A lot of the critical enabling technologies was born at DARPA, and eventually it went migrate over to the services, right, once the technology continued to mature. But I, I can tell you, um, there's no better place to go to do a stint uh, than go to DARPA and solve some of these really tough critical problems, right? Love to have you there. And by the way, I also like to steal DARPA PMs. After their tour at DARPA, I like to steal them into research and engineering under my shop. So if you can see a lot of my principal directors uh, for critical technology areas, I've stolen from DARPA. Because <laughs> okay. they're, they're brilliant folks. Right. We've, we've talked quite a bit about being responsive and, and DARPA's ability to sort of pivot when necessary. So one of the questions that just came in from the audience is how do we change our government or industry posture toward risk which is a key part of being a part of DARPA, in order to be responsive to our current environment. Boy, somebody sing my tune, <laughs> okay? This is exactly what I've been pounding on, right? We need to be, we need to move faster against our threats, right? The threats that we're facing. Our adversaries moving faster. We have to move faster. But you have a system that's inherently built that's risk averse, right? Because any time a program that trips up, Congress slap, slaps you on the side of your head, right? And they take your budget, they cut your budget because you're behind schedule, right? And so this is something we have to work across the board uh, uh, within DOD as well as uh, with the Hill to allow us to be, uh, take more risks. DARPA has the opportunity to take risks. It's okay if they fail. Once you migrate that technology into a program of record, you have the entire budget laid out. And program managers are not incentivized to take risks. They're incentivized to deliver their products on schedule, on cost. Okay, so therefore they're extremely risk averse for a reason, right? It's the end of their career when they screw up. So this is uh, definitely a department-wide problem, and uh, I've been trying to push this internally. And one of the reasons why we created Raider was exactly to address some of these issues. If you have a great prototype that's solving a capability that I need, we want to test it out. Let's test it out in a contested environment. Does it still work other than your lab? If it still works, there are some options. We can go into rapid fielding, right? We can go into these mid-tier acquisition. We could, we could say, hey, this is good enough. I'd like to get 5,000 of these. Right. Or uh, do we need to go through another design iteration, add some additional capabilities 
so it's more useful for the warfighter. So those are all the things, multiple pathways, but this is exactly what we're doing under radar, okay? And my ANS partner, Acquisition System, the Under Secretary of Acquisition System, and Dr. Bill LaPlante, and I work hand in glove, okay? The best critical uh, prototypes that we define, he will look to accelerate the acquisition pathway to get it into production as quickly as possible. Okay. Uh, one final question uh, from, again, an audience question. Uh, I heard from Tim Bunning from the Air Force Research Laboratory say there is a shift from focus on exquisite systems mm -hmm. to flexible distributed systems built from lower cost scalable components. Is this a DOD wide philosophy? So this sounds very much like a space <laughs> <laughs> system going, going away from uh, a few multi-billion dollar satellites to a uh, distributed a hybrid architecture um, in which you may have hundreds of satellites. And that, well, first of all, if you just have a few exquisite systems, it's vulnerable if you lose them and you can't afford to lose them. So um, this sounds like this is tier toward more of a, uh, a hybrid architecture from space. But this is not necessarily the same thing across the board for everything. Some things uh, are more expensive and we do have to build it, but cost is always the final factor in everything we buy, okay? I've had the hypersonics uh, uh, folks that, that uh, especially the contractor who built hypersonics, want to know what is it they can do. I said, well, number one, uh, deliver on time, on schedule, and get the cost down, right? Because if it's too expensive, we can't afford to buy very many. Focus on things that can reduce costs. Understand what are the components within your system that drives costs, and drive the cost down, right? So it becomes affordable. Otherwise, so expensive, you're not sure you can shoot them. Right? That doesn't make any sense. Thank you very much. Really appreciate you guys uh, uh, listening. And uh, don't forget, join DARPA. <laughs> Thank you.